morning, everybody, and welcome to the first ever Climathon Global Awards. Um, welcome here in this phenomenal venue, the Grand Palais. And I think I can already congratulate you probably on the first achievement of the day of actually finding this room because the Grand Palais is so huge and it's a small door tucked away in the corner. So congrats on starting the day well. My name is Niels, I'm a serial entrepreneur, I work with Climate Kick, and I'm also a proud organizer of the Climathon in the city where I currently reside, in Zurich, Switzerland. And I will be hosting you throughout this award ceremony. Um, before getting started, I really would like to extend a word of th thanks to Change Now for the partnership we have and us being able to actually host this event, these award ceremonies, at their venue. I think it speaks testimony to the philosophy of us, of how we think about impact. We believe there is already way too much fragmentation in the impact sphere, and we actually, in order to tackle the challenge of our time, we need to work together, we need to collaborate, so we're very grateful to be able to be here. Thank you, Change Now, for having us. Um, I also would like to know a little bit about you guys here in the audience, so if we can get a little bit of light, maybe just some questions by, uh, by show of hands. Who of you here would say, I am an entrepreneur or working for a for impact organization? Can you just raise your hands? Okay, that's about half. Who would say, I work for city authorities, local government, national government? Okay, 10%. The others we have as well, other people? Okay, variety, thank you. Um, before coming today, whom of you had actually already heard of Climathon? Can you raise your hands? Okay, that's 80%. Congrats to our marketing team there. Uh, well done. Who had participated in one of the climathons? Okay, a smaller percentage. And my final question to you is, whom of you would say, I am a citizen of a city around the world? Can you raise your hands? Okay, nearly everybody. You've come to the right place. Um, what is our program for today? So we have a very fast-paced two hours ahead of us. We're going to hear 10 citizens' projects five cities. We're going to hear from 10 jury members. We're going to have one keynote speak, speech, a video. We are going to hand out four awards. And actually, you guys, even if you don't know it yet, are also going to hand out two awards. So if you do the math, that's over 30 people on stage in two hours. Um, and as you guessed, we're probably going to need Swiss timekeeping to make that work and to keep up the pace. After my introduction, we're going to have a keynote by Kirsten Dunlop. We're going to hand out the Citizens Award. We move to the second track, the cities. Then we're going to do the public awards, about which I will say more later. And then we're going to close at around um, quarter past one-ish. Um, now, why are we actually here? That the climate crisis is real and existential, I don't think I have to tell you as an informed audience. That we need urgent action on many fronts, and that one organization cannot do it alone, I also don't think I have to tell you. But what I would like to tell you, what we would like to tell you about today, is that actually we at Climate Kick have co-developed a systems innovation approach that is gaining a lot of traction currently, um, which Kirsten will talk more about in her keynote. But we're not here to talk just about that, but specifically to talk about one of our flagship programs, the Climathon. With um, uh, with progress in global politics, moving at a sluggish pace at the moment, we have created Climathon to focus on an area in the system where change is actually possible and already happening. And that area is cities. Um, in cities all around the world, there are people, in recent years particularly, who've started taking to the street, who've started protesting, uh, there are people taking action. And what we want to do with Climathon, the way we've designed the program, is to help all that energy that is out there, the awareness, to turn that into productive action and develop local solutions. Now, how will we do that very concretely? Climathon essentially is a tool, a tool to help combat climate change. We have designed that because we know that in thousands of cities around the world, there are local organizations, there are groups of people, whether these are NGOs, universities, businesses, co-working spaces, communities, who care about their city, who want to make their cities greener and cleaner. We have created Climathon as a tool to actually enable them, and we call them in our language local organizers, to use that framework to actually bring together for one program citizens, cities, and the local economy to together collaborate on finding solutions for local 
climate challenges. Because as you all know, climate change is a global problem, but it actually has very severe local implications too. And we will hear more from that later. Now, what is the desired outcome of a climate fund? There are three. So the first is the level of, let's call it activation and awareness creation. This is about helping people understand the local challenges. And what we've seen in past years is actually that people who were pre present at climate funds, who were touched by the message, have actually started to change their behavior to become more, more, uh, more sustainable. So that's one thing. The second thing is that in the climate funds, people are not just coming together to have a cup of coffee, though we do that too. They're actually coming together to develop actual solutions. So there's ideation to tackle those challenges and come up with ideas for projects on how to contribute to combating climate change. And that leads to the third one, because it's not just about gen generating ideas to solve the local challenges, but the program actually offers concrete support to move from idea to action. And if you add that together, given the fact that Climathon is happening in cities around the world, we actually have a global community of activated citizens. Let me make that slightly more concrete. So a Climathon has four distinct phases. The first phase is what we call the pre-program, and this is about activation. So organizing events, media outreach, online outreach, to actually get the citizens involved about what the local reality is, working together with city authorities to frame challenges to be worked on, as I mentioned before, during the hackathon, where between 12 and 72 hours, people are coming together. We've had hackathons with 30 people, we've had hackathons with 300 people, um, to actually develop these ideas, which are then taking forward post-program, so after the hackathon, where they re receive support, mentoring, access to incubators, etc., etc. And today, we're in the fourth phase, and it's the first time we're doing it, which are the Global Awards, which is essentially a celebration of innovations that happen locally, and we want to give some of them a boost and actually create a space, maybe for some of them to be replicated. We're handing out awards in two different categories. First, we're looking at citizens. So these can be projects, startups, ideas developed by local citizens. And the second thing we're doing is we want to award innovative projects by cities. We've realized there are not that many places out there where we can actually, for a wider public, award or put the spotlight on some of the solutions that cities are developing. So it's a pilot for us to actually try to shape the narrative to get cities more involved with developing solutions. Um, with that, I want to say also just a bit of history. Climathon started in 2015. We were just in 19 cities with 600 participants. And in just five years, organically, it has grown to this year 145 cities, 6,500 participants, and we're actually on a path to scale this much wider. Our goals and our projections are that by 2022, we will have 1,000 cities, we will have 100,000 plus participants, and we'll try to activate 100 million people through the outreach that happens with Climathon. So I think what you can see, that Climathon is already becoming a true global wave. However, the exciting thing, I think, about Climathon is that it's not an isolated program, but it's actually often part of a bigger portfolio of activities that try to change systems. And for that, I would really like to ask Kirsten Dunlop, CEO of EIT Climate Kick, on stage, who will do a much better job of explaining our systems innovation approach. Kirsten, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Niels, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for finding the room and finding us. And so I'm going to link straight up to what you heard. Um, now, this is where I'm going to take the advice of the sound team who warned me against earrings, and I worried about nudity because it feels nude without earrings. Okay, so I'll hold my earrings. Um, so, Climate Kick. EIT Climate Kick is all about innovation, but particularly about innovation commensurate with the scale and the urgency of the challenge we face. And that looks something like this. The need to do something completely unprecedented, really unprecedented. And we have been in the innovation business for 10 years, and for many of us working in Climate Kick, we've been in the innovation business for 20 or 30 years. And there are some patterns and habits about the way in which we have brought innovation into the world or what we've used it for. 
Often we've used it for unprecedented things, but in accidental, opportunistic and emergent ways. And now we have a problem of needing deliberate, systematic, joined up, global, collective, unprecedented action. And that means we need a different way of thinking about how we do innovation, what we use it for, how we organize around it, how we finance it, and how we connect it in to the mechanisms by which the world takes decisions at every scale. In a city context, that looks like actually managing to address every single layer in a living system of people living normal everyday lives on a daily basis, transacting in and out of the things that are material and the things that are immaterial about the cities we live in and the places we love and care about. Not so much, so the innovation that produces the solutions at every layer, we desperately need. But we also need innovation to be able to address how they connect with one another and how they integrate into completely exponential shifts in the structures of how we think and how we play. And that is really what has led us to take a journey ourselves in the last three years and reflect on what we must or should do, what would be our license to operate as a community of change makers and change actors in the world and as an instrument of European intent and political will when it comes to research and innovation and as a catalyst for change across a world of connected organizations and communities. And our reflection has been we need to shift from a single point project-focused, project-financed, incre essentially incremental way of thinking about how to make it safe for us to take some steps from here to here, and how to fundamentally rethink what we use innovation for. So what I'm going to explain as quickly as I can is just a flash, a glimpse of what does that look like in practice. What does Climathon, as an initiative which is all about the agency of people living everyday lives in everyday places, connecting up to a broader system of movements for change and a broader systems of system of deliberate, systematic transformation through innovation. And I'm going to stop here for a second because these are the essential ingredients of this cake. Let's start with the question of demand-led. So much of innovation is focused on the supply of innovation to the world how to educate entrepreneurs or how to educate people to become entrepreneurs, how to develop business models and mousetraps that will attract money from financial markets and venture capital, how to come up with new technical solutions, develop technologies, how to connect with other people and connect those technologies into some form of economic model. But it's always about supply. And very often we end up in a situation that tends to be discrete, single, single point, technology focused, technology optimistic, and in the end, also incremental if it's being funded by those who demand to see some form of predictable outcome, reliable, predictable within time. What we rarely see is a willingness to understand that innovation needs or is one of the most cost-effective, risk-effective, generative ways of dealing with uncertainty. And if we think of the problem we face, we face a problem of profound and radical and frankly frightening uncertainty. The uncertainty not only of our physical futures, but the uncertainty of our social and civic and political dynamics, and the technical uncertainty of how we would conceivably take almost every aspect of the way in which we've taught ourselves to understand growth, prosperity, well-being, and economic mechanisms to a completely different place. So that uncertainty can be managed, but it can be managed by working back from the problems, the differences we want to see. If we can begin to even just imagine through roadmaps and carbon commitments some form of structural non-linear or discontinuous difference in carbon emissions in a reliance on each other in a way of using resources and anchor innovation in that place and in particular harness it as a mechanism for accelerating learning. And that's when I go to a portfolio approach. The value of innovation in the face of uncertainty is that if you structure it not as a hunt for the winners, a hunt for the best solutions amongst many, is it going to be VHS or beta, let's work out which one we bet on, but you deliberately structure it as a mechanism of, of experimenting with relatively degrees managed risk on hundreds of solutions simultaneously to quickly understand from all of the possibilities of different ideas and insights what actually works, what might combine, what synergies we haven't even thought about, what strange bedfellows, and serendipity, creative collisions between things. And 
that's a spread, a spread of multiple, simultaneous, diverse things that we are testing in reality. And that gets me to learning by doing, that we actually learn from putting those things in place, in real time, on ourselves, in enough of a bounded space and a bounded way, so not necessarily 250,000 homes at once, if we're talking about retrofit, but maybe 10,000. Or maybe three streets and two streets doing one thing and four streets doing another thing, and energy systems starting to play in different mechanisms of the way they connect to waste and water and algae and so on. And that means also thinking in terms of leverage points. The interesting challenge for us as humans is that we inhabit systems, we are part of systems, and we've barely learned to understand how they work. And the interesting things about systems is that they change themselves. If you can work out how to intervene in the dynamics of infectious, viral, contagious adjacencies, and complementarities and influences. And that's a huge part of what we're trying to do. How can we design innovation in such a way that we think deliberately about innovating in fiscal mechanisms, in policy, in planning, in procurement, in, in cultural frames, in music, in innovation, in education, around citizen participation, ownership and governance, at the same time as we innovate in technology, in engineering solutions, in supply chain and logistics, and bring it together as a set of creative collisions and synergies. It requires us to systematically learn to structure innovation as a mechanism of constant experimentation, systematic learning, and the conversion of that learning into multiple feedback loops, and most importantly of all, information that policymakers, decision makers, holders of capital and regulation can use to take decisions with for much more significant structural change. So this is what we've done this year, last year. We launched an experiment on ourselves. We launched eight areas of what we call deep demonstrations, because our sense of the deficit in the world at the moment is our desperate need to see what it might look like. Not a single living lab in a university campus, but a whole city, genuinely sustainable, genuinely circular, genuinely net carbon neutral. What does it look like? How do we live? What do we do? How do things begin to produce permutations and combinations? And that one of those areas is in cities. We have 15 cities working in this way, going, embarking on an extraordinary journey, a 10, a 5-year journey, to achieve some remarkable degrees of change. And those cities are actively working to learn from one another, win one another. And they're working with, at this stage in the process, design partners, simply helping them work out together what each city holds as an intent what it needs, what it wants, what's it locked into, what its assumptions produce without barely knowing and seeing them. And many of those cities are helping us, helping each, these partners are helping each city think about dark matters. What are the small, tiny pieces of the rules that we follow every day, the strata title rules, the way we recycle plastics, the way we manage the car parking in streets, that if we could change those, you begin to create a set of different habits and practices. And how does that connect with the bigger order system of procurement possibilities? Bankers without boundaries, how do we reverse the fact that the default in a city is that it costs less to build a building than it costs to, build a to plant a tree as you roll it up on scale, and so on. And then, that really then goes into a whole iterative mechanism of working constantly over time to understand what are we willing, what's the scope of our ambition, what are we willing to describe as a set of outcomes, how can we understand where to get innovation to play and to work, orchestrate, put in place multiple experiments as a spread, as a portfolio, and then learn constantly from them. And plug that learning into each other's understanding, into our decision-making, into our capital investments, and into our relationships with each other. So you are part of an event that celebrates a set of sensing and learning mechanisms through Climathon, and a competition that acknowledges the effort and energy that is going in cities all over the world to start this work, to get things connected and to start to bring citizens together with city planners and authorities and decision makers and funders and put it together. And you are here as part of a broader system of change agents desperately trying to bring as much as we can 
to the volume, the connectedness, the pace, the scale of that, to see if we can get from 15 cities working now, in the mode in which I was describing, to 100 cities working within the reach of a couple of years, and ideally two, 300 as quickly as possible to create the capability for us to work at such scale and with such complexity, but with the clarity of intent. And that's where I'm going to finish and pass back to Niels with a sense of transformation in time is not just about the scale of what we need to do, but the extent to which the clock ticks every single minute that we don't make choices to change the way we are doing it. Thank you. Good luck to those who are competing. And thank you for making a journey here to connect. Please use the carbon footprint of being here to make sure you do something with those connections. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Kirsten, for this enlightened presentation. Um, you will be available here after the, presenta after the awards show for any questions that might still linger. Now we're going to move to the first track that we're going to award solutions in. And we're going to hear from 10 innovations around the world. And I think it's Im important to remember that many of these ideas didn't exist a few months ago. These teams hadn't even met. They were citizens of cities around the world who took the agency to actually develop solutions. And I think what we heard before is that nearly all of you, or actually all of you, are citizens of cities small and wide across the world. And we'd like to use this moment um, for, for some reflection. So I'd like to ask everybody to stand up. And don't worry, you don't have to move, so you can leave all your stuff. But just stand up quickly. If we can get light in the room, please. Turn around and look for somebody, maybe in the row before, after, who you don't know. Make eye contact. And for three minutes, together, speak maybe about some of these questions. So introduce yourself, where you're from. What have you done for your city? What could you do in the future? So meet some new people. Three minutes, go. Okay, super. <laughs> yeah, super. Oh.
actually try on your own skin. Okay. So please take your seat again. <laughs> yeah, you too. So that was three minutes of buzzing energy. You experienced a bit of the Climathon vibe. Now imagine 72 hours of that with even more people together. Give you a sense of what happens. Thank you for coming along. Now, before you're going to hear from the 10 finalists, just a few words on where we came from. So we had 145 Climathons this year. Winning local projects were able to apply. We received 160 of them. 88 were long-listed. 10 have been invited to come here to Paris and are already winners for us. Yesterday, they participated in an intensive learning boot camp to, to make sure that all of their projects actually receive a big boost. Today, the jury will hand out three awards, and you guys, and I'm getting to that in a second, will also hand out an award for the Citizens Track. Just a bit about background, about the applications, where they came from. As you can see here, a very diverse field, um, from waste management to circular economy to food all the way up to climate finance. We actually had applications from 51 nationalities on all six continents, and we're quite happy that the gender mix was quite well distributed between male and female applications in this sphere. What kind of prizes are we going to hand out? So the first three prizes that you see here are handed out by the jury and have actually already been decided who wins these, because all of the finalists have handed in materials beforehand. The jury has taken a lot of time to, um, to actually evaluate them and select the winner. Um, but you are not going to sit here afterwards just guessing who you think will win the different prizes, but you also have a role, because you are going to hand out, together with the online voting that we did before the event, uh, another audience award for the, um, for the citizens' track. And how that works. Afterwards, when you take out your smartphone and you go into any browser, you type in slido.com with the code CLIMATHON, automatically, for each of the different projects that comes up, um, there will be a question to rate the project on a scale from one to five. Okay, and everybody can do that once. And in the end, we will then look which of the different teams got the best, uh, the best rating. And toward the end of the show, we will then hand out these awards, okay? Slido.com, the code is Climathon there. Um, how is it going to work specifically now? So we will get the first five teams afterwards to come pitch. They will have 90 seconds to pitch. Um, Merit, where are you? Merit is sitting right here in the middle, and she actually has a timer that with 90 seconds ticking down. So when you pitch, make sure that you look at Merit. When the time is up, she's going to stand up, and I'm going to need all of your help to actually clap to make sure that the project really stops after 90 seconds. Because we know the entrepreneurial minded. If you give them an opportunity, they will just keep talking, right? Because they want your attention and opportunities. After that, um, I will ask them a quick, audience, uh, a quick question that we've prepared, and that is the time for you to rate the project on slido.com using the hashtag Climathon. Now, we have, as I mentioned before, had the help of a phenomenal jury helping us with the citizens track. Um, and uh, except, unfortunately, for Dennis Pamlin, who cannot be here today, the other five are with us. And I'd really like to ask the jury, the jury now to come on stage and join me on these colorful chairs that are here. So please, jury, come to the stage um, and take your place for the citizens awards. So Afro Shah, Gabriela Gandel, Connie Angus Tyson, Sylvia Macon, Vincent Tubu Flacher, please take your seat here and let's give some applause for the jury. Um, at the same time, I would already like to ask the first team to be ready. And for the first pitch that we're going to hear, we're actually going to travel to Vienna. We're going to hear from Richard. I think Fabian has the microphone here for you, Richard. So please come on stage. This is your clicker. The moment you start speaking, the timer for Merit will start. Good luck, and we're looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Hey. Well, 1.15. 1.15. That's the average people per car in European commuter transport. That's horrible, right? That's a lot of traffic jams, a lot of pollution, and of course, a lot of CO2 emissions. My name is Richard, I'm from Blitz of the Future, and we want to change that. We want all streets worldwide look like that. 
How do we do that? Well, everybody knows this, right? Speed meters with immediate feedback about your speed. Well, we do the same with the occupancy of a car. We just count the people in a car and then give you feedback. So imagine you're going on the road in a car to work every morning. Basically, there's three contact points. The first one is we count the people in your car. The second one is we give you feedback, happy or bad smiley, depending on the number of people in your car. And last but not least, we promote sustainable alternatives to use, such as carpooling or public transport. We finance ourselves with two customers. On the one hand, we have public administration, whom we help to reduce CO2 emissions. On the other hand, we promote uh, sustainable transport companies and help them acquire customers. We have a very skilled and multi-skilled uh, um, um, team, and we just met three months ago at the Climathon, and we we're happy to talk to potential investors and partners, and especially we want to create and implement our vision, which is a happy smiley for everybody. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Richard. You couldn't see it, but he finished exactly when the last second was ticking away. So as an imported Swiss, I'm very proud of that timekeeping. Well done. Um, so remember, now you guys can vote. So take out your phone, slido.com, climathon. The question will mysteriously appear. How are you going to rate uh, Blitzer for future on a scale from one to five? And I have a question also for you guys, Richard, because you actually met only three months ago, and now you're already here. What role did it play that you didn't really know each other? How did it come about? Well, that was actually really fun because we didn't uh, jump into creation uh, of the solution and prototyping, but we really took time to describe and discuss the problem and to really find out how the different actors uh, interact with each other and why do existing solutions not work out. And that actually led to a very, very unconventional uh, solution and proposal which I just presented to you. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. Will. Thank you. Thanks. So... For our second project, we're actually staying in Paris here, Blocktricity, Jean-Baptiste, the floor much. is yours. Thank you. Let me first, um, by starting by a question. Who wants some change? If we are here at Change Now, I think everybody wants. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> so, uh, yep, the clicker. Blocktricity asset management. As we've seen in the previous presentation, uh, um, the major problem with uh, the change is financing. So, the, in the former uh, in the former system, we had the we we had centralized uh, initiatives. Change was coming from big initiatives, but now with more decentralized assets, with more EV, with more renewables, all of that needs a new solutions to finance to manage. And that's why we built with our blockchain. It's a green blockchain that we developed a solution to help finance, trace, and manage uh, energy assets. The, the problem uh, is that most of the time, uh, when we do, we could have said we can do crowdfunding. But the problem is crowdfunding, you have 100 people that will invest in one project. What we're trying to bring is that we want to bring citizens that get involved in the system. 100 people will invest in 100 projects. We built our first energy community in the south of France, and we had the problem to implement batteries. <laughs> so we, we added, uh, um, we recycled batteries. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Jean-Baptiste, we have the team in the background. Um, again, for you guys, time to vote. Okay, smartphone out. The next question is on for Blocktricity. Um, Jean-Baptiste, also a question for you. You can keep the mic. We are here in Paris, you're, where, you, where, you're, uh, where your uh, solution came from. Is that special for you? What are the local challenges, the climate challenges that you care about here in Paris? So first, uh, what we wanted to do with the Climathon was to meet people. Uh, with the team, we had the opportunity to meet with citizens that shared their experience with us, uh, in, um, improving our solution. But then uh, Paris, had, we had to, um, to protect this cultural heritage, while uh, trying to build a new world. And it was really interesting. We had the, the opportunity to see the difference between uh, some type of uh, uh, energy efficiency, efficiency um, um, 
-hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. And we tried uh, different, we have seen uh, different uh, aspects. And uh, small changes can make big changes on the long run. Cool. Thank you very much, Jean Baptiste. So we're going for the next uh, pitch, actually, to the Americas. Uh, we're going to get here from Carbon Zero. Jellet, the floor is yours. This is your clicker, and that's your microphone, and I like your hat. Thank you. 800 million people played Pokemon Go. What if they were playing a different game? A game to reduce their carbon footprint. That game is called Carbon Zero. Listen, we're gonna need a lot of different solutions to deal with climate change. But if we don't change our behavior, adoption of these solutions is going to be limited. That's why we are using the coolest immersive technology and latest neuroscience research to help people deal with their fear from climate change and stay positive. How does it work? You start with Captain Joy. He gamifies a carbon calculator for you. Then you go on real world missions, like trying a new plant-based restaurant or planting a tree with a local organization. And then you see your impact with our AR Zerons, cuter than Pokemons. <laughs> um, games have incredible power, right? And we're building a game that's collecting all the science and letting you compete and collaborate to actually save the planet. Three months ago, this was just an idea in my head. Now we are on the Android store with test users building this with data-driven analytics. We have a really detailed business plan and we have an amazing team. You want to invest in us. If you want to be a hero and help millions of people get to zero. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jellet. Um, also, a reminder for all of you to vote now. Uh, Slido.com, hashtag Climathon to rate. Take out so, those phones. <laughs> <laughs> so, a question for you, Janet. You guys are an international team. I believe you're the only San Francisco native. You have people from uh, Australia, Hong Kong, uh, Argentina, I believe. How, what role yeah. does it play for So, we you? met at the hackathon. Uh, some people were traveling. Some people are local. Some people are students. We have students from Kenya that were helping out. Um, you know, there's a lot of research on how actually diversity creates a better product. And I think we're seeing that. Because we met at a hackathon, we can really bring out each other's creativity. Uh, and the key point for this to work is to stay aligned on the vision and your Swiss, the timetables. <laughs> and for that, we are very grateful to have Penelope, who has immense experience in actually managing big teams. Um, yeah, we worked, um, we were, I think, in like five different companies over December and January, and we're still on schedule, so. Great. Thank you yeah. so much. Garvin Zero. Thank you. So, for the fourth team, we're actually going to go very close by to Zurich. I did not have anything to do with them being here, okay? Even though I'm a Zurich native, this was purely the jury. All right, the floor is yours, Karen. Okay, let's start with a quick quiz. What's the difference between those two pictures? It's hard to tell, right? But there is one. It's 17 hours of traveling time, 600 euros, and 2,166 kilograms of CO2 gas emissions. Because one of those pictures was made in Japan, the other one in Lausanne, Switzerland, which for me is really close by. That's why we raise the question, why go far away if everything is close by? Our vision is to offer a more sustainable travel alternative without any compromise. And this is one of the most important issues when it comes to climate change. Behind my back, you can see the number of air travelers just in 2018 and just in Switzerland. So this number is shockingly high and calls for action. And that's where close by comes in. You can, on our platform, you can choose between a variety of places all over the world and click on the red dot. As you can see, our platform provides you with alternative traveling destinations that are closer, cheaper, and more sustainable to visit. Our goal is to get close by in more countries such as, such as France. So if you feel really adventurous, afterwards you can go and make a selfie in front of the Statue of Liberty, which is just three and a half kilometers away from here. If you want to talk about this huge opportunity, we got the numbers to back it up. Come and approach us. If you want to make a change, go on closeby.ch and support us. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Karen, for your presentation. Also, a quick oh, question yeah. for you. Um, and remember to rate close by as well on your phone, slido.com, Climathon. So you're focusing on the leisure market. Um, exactly. But we are an international program who also has to do traveling every now and then. Have you thought of ways to help us as Climathon and such programs? Well, my first idea was that you could hire us as experts. Um, but uh, let us talk about the numbers. If you look at the numbers in Europe, 80% of traveling, uh, of uh, air traveling is due to leisure and 20% is due to business traveling. So we're tackling the problem by the 80-20 principle. So we try to attack the huge uh, amount of uh, leisure traveling and um, business traveling is, um, is something that you should ask yourself. I mean, I guess that a lot of people came here by airplane and I hope that you had in mind how much impact you have to make here in order to, um, to Compensate. to compensate this. <laughs> and please think about that when you go home on Saturday evening. Think about it. Was it really worth it to take an airplane to come here? Thank you very much, Karen. Food for thought. <laughs> All right. So for the fifth presentation, we're going to Trondheim. Um, Shemita, I'd say the floor is yours. Here's your clicker. Go ahead. Mm, this one's next. Yes. Green. Um, hi, I'm Shamita. I'm an architect. And this is my friend, Kevin. Now, Kevin lives in the city, uh, has a nice apartment, works nine to five, uh, the really good life, I would say. But uh, despite being surrounded by people all the time, Kevin feels a little lonely. And um, add to that the high cost of rent, uh, the commute, the monthly bills, and it doesn't feel worth it because he barely spends time in his apartment. And that's when co-using comes in. Um, Co-using uh, connects him to a community with uh, similar time schedules, activity levels, and um, it, allows, uh, it allows them to rent their space out to people with complementary space needs when they're not at home. Just by renting their space out for about eight hours, they reduce their rent by almost 50%. Sounds too good to be true, right? Let's see how it works. So in the phase one, uh, we uh, make use of uh, existing infrastructure only. But as the idea catches on, uh, we design modules which are um, designed for sharing. So uh, we have uh, flexible, personal, and community modules. And uh, yeah, imagine collapsible walls, um, adding spaces really based on the users. Um, if you choose co-using, you reduce material, energy, transport, and hu um, become mindful of human consumption. So choose uh, co-using, be like Kevin. Mm. <laughs> oh. Oh. Thanks so much, um, Shamita. Also again, reminder, rate uh, co-using as well using Slido and uh, code Climathon now. Um, a question for you. Uh, your entire team is not from Trondheim, but you're working for Trondheim. Why that motivation? Um, so as a team, we all believe that um, carbon emissions don't have any borders, and um, climate change doesn't have any borders. So it doesn't matter where we're making the difference as long as we're doing our best towards it. Um, and Trondheim is a really special city that way. They're very um, driven to make a change. So they're really supportive of their students and uh, they give us um, all the resources we need to make our idea actually happen. We're in talks with the Trondheim uh, municipality right now um, to see if we can combine our idea with future housing projects. So yeah, come and be a part of this. Great, thank you very much, Shamida. Okay, so if you've lost count, we've had five teams now, and we're actually going to take a small break and go back to yesterday. I mentioned we've done a bootcamp, and we would like to get the video up and running. We've made a short video to give you some impression of what actually happened during the learning bootcamp that happened yesterday. The video, please.
So. Thanks a lot. Now let's move forward with the next five citizens team. Um, and we're actually for pitch six going to edible roofs again to Zurich. Timna, where are you? There. Fabian has the microphone for you. And I have the clicker. Yeah, the floor is yours. Ten years and that are out there, so past, present, and future, because the okay. EIT and the kicks were an extraordinary. So this is Kirsten Dunlop, who has so much to say that even when it's not her turn, I think somebody accidentally turned on her microphone instead of this one. Can you try again, Timna? Works. Yeah, it works now. Okay. okay. So let's start again, Merit, um, and the floor is yours. This is Marta. Marta lives in Zurich. She wants to know where her food comes from. So she has decided to start growing her own vegetables. Unfortunately for her, on her tiny balcony, there fit only about three tomato plants. So, very motivated, she signs up for a garden parcel. But she's disappointed to learn that she's number 180 on the waiting list, with an expected waiting time of two years. Now, what Marta doesn't know, all the flat roofs in the city of Zurich have an area of about 700 soccer fields, and the city has passed a policy to green all of them. That's where we come in. Marta logs onto our platform and starts searching for a rooftop garden parcel on a public building close to her. When she finds a suitable rooftop, she applies right away, and already one week later, she's standing for the first time in her new rooftop garden. Wow. <laughs> this thing, very well done in the improvisation. We have a new microphone here because probably was the battery running down. Better? Well done. Um, so also a question for you, Dina. Um, so your team met during Climathon as well, right? How is it to work together this intensively with previously strangers? Actually, it was a really interesting experience because we are coming from so diverse backgrounds with very different skill sets that really complemented each other well. And to be honest, if you're working 24 hours very intensely with very little sleep on a topic that everybody's excited and interested in, you get a pretty good grasp of the other people of the team. And afterwards, you know them well and you know if you want to go on with them on a project like this. <laughs> Not strangers anymore. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dinner. And a reminder to vote. I didn't mention it again. The question is still up. Sorry, let's switch the cues. Go ahead. Thank you so much. All right, so for project number seven, we're actually going to Egypt, to Cairo. Yasmin, this is your clicker, and the floor is yours. Oh, no, the other one, the green one. Oh. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Yasmin from Egypt, Cairo, and I'm going to present you Soap to Soap. 36 billion, and this number is end up in landfills every year. It's soap waste. Due to hygienic reason, hotels change every day the soup bar with every new customer. And this generates 36 billion. And from where I come, the number is not, is not different. It's 1,010 from Egypt alone, every year, soup waste that end in landfills. What we offer as Soap to Soup, an online platform that links hotels, women in rural villages, by celebrating with NGOs in their country, to uh, recycle the soup by themselves. And finally, we produce an affordable soup bar for everyone that can uh, buy it. I know the question you have now. Is it hygienic to recycle it? The answer is yes. Through several processes, it goes through collecting and sorting, then sterilization, going to finally molding and drawing the soup to be affordable for everyone to buy. Our soup bar price is cheaper than the cheapest competitor by eight times, by a price of 0.035 euro compared to 0.29 to the cheapest competitor. And it, it's not only cheaper, it's also carbon fingerprint plus. With uh, actually all the soup uh, with an average is one gram to fingerprint of it. Our, our soup bar is less, so less than this. So how, where is the cost? What is the cost structure of it? 
Our cost structure is mainly in the transportation to transport the soup from hotels to uh, rural villages. <laughs> Thanks so much for the pitch. That was actually the last slide I saw. Um, so, Yasmin, again, a reminder for you guys, rate the project on slido.com. A question for you in, in Europe that I know well, the sentiment, the public image of climate change has changed a lot last year. How is that in Cairo and in Egypt in general? What is the public perception of the problem there? Uh, actually, in Egypt, uh, more people are aware of climate change than ever right now. Uh, and in the climate zone, I actually have a more impression about it from all the ideas that Egyptian got. Actually, we had in Egypt like 30 teams competing with ideas about climate action. So it's more aware than ever here. Great. Very happy to hear that. Thank you so much, Jasmine. <laughs> all right. So we're going a little bit north to Belgium, to Liège. Coralie? Apolline. <laughs> Apolline. Okay. Sorry, I have the wrong name. It's okay. The clicker and the microphone. Um, this one? Yep. Go ahead. Do you know you don't have to go overseas to find a hidden treasure? In fact, it has always been in the palm of your hand. This hidden treasure is your unused spaces as well as your talents. We identified a global issue during the Climaton in Liège, which is a lot of unused spaces around the world. Urban B connects people and nature through local, authentic and sustainable experiences. Urban B establishes relationship between two kinds of people, fellow spaces owner, and people interested in their urban farming. What is Urban B? Urban B is a platform. Here, is, as you can see, is the app. People will commit to major values with our charter. They will add filters and their geo-tracking, and all of this will help the right people get in touch. Commitment and respect are our core principles. Um, people will get the experience on the app, but as well in real life with our derivated products, such as workshops, open garden events, and neighborhood parties. We are really excited for you to become a member of our Urban B community and give me a hive. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Pauline. Again, reminder to rate the project here. Um, so. A question, you guys were really good at mobilizing for the online vote we saw. So how do you feel is the support from the local community in Liège? Uh, in fact, when we talk about our solution, a lot of people are really excited to take part and become, um, yeah, as I said, an Urban B member, a community member. And um, we have a lot also support of uh, the city's authority and other cities' authority asked if we could implement this solution to their cities. And um, I have uh, also another news that another news. Sorry, <laughs> we are taking part in um, a local food, mm -hmm. um, sustainable food uh, solution uh, event that takes place in March, and that's really, really um, proving that people are interested and want to invest in that, and we are really proud of it. <laughs> Great. Congratulations, Pauline and the team. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, two more pitches to go. It's time for Wula and Annalisa. This is your microphone. This is your clicker, and the floor is yours. So, hi, everyone. My name is Annalisa, and I'm from Estonia. It's one of the smallest countries in Europe. We only have 1.3 million people, but still, we produce 8,000 kilometers worth of bubble wrap waste every year because of e-commerce. And this is only Estonia. There are two billion digital buyers globally. We're currently using styrofoam and plastic bubble wrap to protect parcels because they're cheap and lightweight. But 96% of this ends up in a landfill where it never degrades. So our solution is to produce bubble wrap that's made out of sheep wool to reduce e-commerce waste. Sheep wool is currently an unused resource. 90% of it is thrown away, so we decided to give this waste a new life. Our product is compostable at home. It's shockproof, temperature and humidity resistant, and we're using uh, automated production to keep our costs low. So currently we can produce a package of 20 meters for 1060, and we sell it for 16 euros. 
Uh, we're currently piloting with the market leading uh, postal provider in the Baltics. And even if we reach a uh, humble 10% market share, we will be saving 64 kilometers of bubble wrap from growing into circulation per month. The global e-commerce market is growing at a 20% growth rate, so the potential in this is huge. And I am very lucky to work with one of the best designers and operations specialists in changing this industry. And we are also raising funds to do this. Thank you. This is the product. This is the product. So you saw in the video somebody cuddling with this. So if you yeah. want to try cuddling with it, come up to Annalisa afterwards. So this was one of the local challenges uh, on reducing waste from e-commerce. Why did you decide to work on this particular challenge and how did Climathon help you move forward? Uh, so we actually got the idea just a few days before the Climathon and I wasn't sure if I should go to a hackathon because I had just been to a hackathon the previous weekend But it was good that I went because we're <laughs> now we're here uh, But a circular economy and especially packaging has been an issue that I care about for a long time And this is not the first uh, I would say project that we have done in the field of uh, sustainable packaging So it was just a uh, quite logical continuation to that Right place, right time. Okay, well, congratulations, and remember to rate the project. Thank you. <laughs> so we have a very special thing that we also didn't know at first. For the last pitch, um, we're also going to Tallinn, because we have another idea working on the same challenge that was posted um, locally. And we have Alisa, not Annalisa, this time for the final pitch. The floor is yours. An average European creates 170 kilos of packaging waste per year. And this number is expected to increase with the growth in online shopping. Meanwhile, there are more conscious consumers preferring to use less packaging and more package-free shops offering the opportunity to buy package-free. But the problem is that package-free shopping is not comfortable. And this is where what package comes to play. What Package is an online international platform for package-free shops that connects them with their customers. The customer finds the shop closest to them, orders their groceries, and they are delivered to them in reusable containers. These deposit containers can be returned for hygienic washing and reusing, and this way we cut out the waste. There are about 450 package-free shops in Europe, and we have pilot agreements in Tallinn, Tartu, Riga, and Ljubljana. We expect to increase their sales by 30%. And for their customers, we're not just decreasing their waste and making package-free shopping comfortable, we are also decreasing the footprint of this packaging waste of an average family by 19 times. Combined, our team has more than 30 years of experience to make this happen, and we hope to make a neighborhood package-free shopping experience into an international digitalized trend. All help, including financial and mentorship, is welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, also a question for you, having been at the bar camp, at the boot camp yesterday and now here, what are some of your personal or your team's main takeaways from being here? My takeaways are the contacts that I made, uh, the new ideas that I got to know, and also um, the personal conversations with the mentors. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your project with us today. <laughs> Again, um, I hope you rated what package as well. In just a little bit, we're going to close the citizens part of, uh, of rating because we have all your ratings um, with us now. Okay, we are now going to move to hand out the jury awards from the citizens. And how that's going to work is that I'm going to ask one of the jurors to join me afterwards who's going to say something um, about each of the winner projects that they have prepared. We're going to do this in a non-typical fashion. So we're going to start with the first prize, then the second and the third. So after we've announced the winner, you're saying something, we take a quick picture, which is, of course, a very good moment for you guys to tweet about it, right? Share the world, what is actually happening uh, here. Um, so pretty straightforward, I would say. For the first prize, I would love to ask Sylvia Macron to join us. And we had a little joke on the email because you said, yeah, my name is not Macron, but Marcon. Actually, my autocorrect changed it from Macron to, Mar to Macron. Something changed a few years ago with your name, um, I guess. So I think, let's ask, I'm going to give you the microphone already. I'm going to already 
say, this is the winner of the first prize for the citizens track, and it's your turn to announce who the winner is, and then we do the laudation. <laughs> the winner is uh, Wula. The winner is Wula. Come to the stage, please. So, maybe stand next to Silvia. <laughs> this is always awkward if you're standing up here. Okay. So now we're also very interested, Silvia, and in why did this project win and get your support? Um, so this is a completely personal view, but I think uh, that if you have won, probably it's somehow share with the whole jury. What I really like in your application is that you're thinking about something that is a growing uh, concern and challenge for cities, but beyond cities, e-commerce, uh, delivery, and all the emission related not just to the waste and the packaging and the plastic generated by e-commerce, but also from the emission. So um, you're looking at also a natural solution, um, a reusable and sustainable material. And I also like that you're a woman because I believe we need more women uh, as CEO and leading this uh, economic transformation that is long time overdue. Uh, so congratulations, <laughs> it's a wonderful project and really you deserve it, so own it and share it with your team. Maybe two um, uh, aspects where I see there is some growing and space for development. Uh, you're choosing now your clients uh, and make sure you choose them wisely because they are keep uh, delivering and, uh, and delivering materials, so maybe always think that you can also advise them in reducing their greenhouse gas emission and making sure their delivery is zero net emission. Uh, and it's not an easy job, so please keep it up. And uh, also think about your sheep farmers because uh, animals uh, need care as we need. So make sure that you work with uh, farmers that uh, take care of their animals and are compassionate. Many Thank thanks, you. Silvia, and congrats, Wula. Thanks so much. So for the second prize, um, I'm going to ask Vincent to join us. Vincent, this is your microphone. Thanks. Probably if we were a commercial organization, this would be a good moment to take a commercial break, right? To build the suspense. But we're not doing that. We're actually going straight onwards with awarding the second prize winner. And I'm actually going to leave the honor to you. Whoa. OK. So ladies and gentlemen, the big winner is uh, a little bit less big than <laughs> the, the previous one, but uh, one of the also big, big. winners <laughs> is Close By. Close By, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. okay. You can send him in, Vincent. Congrats. Okay, the picture moment again. <laughs> Close By, ladies and gentlemen. Woohoo! All right, so also, Vincent, from you, we'd like to hear why close by. <laughs> uh, first, so um, uh, as part of the jury, we received all the, um, yeah, the files before, and uh, we had a little f a moment to read it and uh, have more information and to vote. And uh, I really, for, for real, noticed uh, close by, and um, I found it was very interesting, and uh, the pitch was as interesting as good than the, the doc. So congrats, first, because sometimes there is, like, um, the difference between the, the documents and the real thing. So congrats, it, it was very great. And um, to me, uh, I think there is a real lack of, uh, of solutions on planes and everything and trips and travels. Uh, it's a little bit of greenwashing for me to be there and give you the prize because in fact, I still take the plane sometimes as a lot of us, I think. But in fact, there will we have to find solutions to make the, maybe solar impulse or things like that, we'll find solutions. And we will find solutions uh, to make it greener uh, after. But actually, we have to, yeah, to keep in mind and uh, to have a better conscience. So to me, I try to take a lot of planning less. Uh, so I make like uh, bike trips. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. So I was like uh, friends to Croatia with bike and then uh, came back with the train and everything. So it was incredible. It's uh, experiences that are incredible. I was in Germany, in France and everything. But we, to have the, the, 
to encourage that kind of comportment of behavior, uh, we have to find solutions to make people and mm -hmm. to empower them. Because if I don't have the solution, I don't have in, in mind, and uh, I want to travel and discover <laughs> things. But if it's like 100 meters in front, why not? So yeah. so great. Thank and, you uh, very much, Vincent, and congrats close by. <laughs> All right, to hand out the third prize, I'm happy that we have Connie with us. Connie, this is your microphone. And we're again directly going to the moment of suspense where we're going to announce the third winner. Um, and that's not the third winner. <laughs> so indeed, this would probably be the moment to go to the commercials. So Let's see. So that works. And this is really creating that suspense. works. <laughs> OK, so that's really creating unintentional suspense. So we can do that too. All right, Connie, so the yeah. third prize for the climate. Really one of my favorites. And uh, the, the prize is Edible Roofs. Edible Roofs, third prize. <laughs> Take it, come to the middle, please. Keep on. Here, you hold it. This is not mine, this is yours. Okay. <laughs> All right, so also, Connie, from you, yeah. why edible roofs? Well, uh, green roofs are on the agenda worldwide uh, as part of the effort we all, uh, to meet the challenges we all face, uh, including climate change, uh, and uh, also denser cities, and uh, the need for greener and healthier neighborhoods. You address all this. You came up with a great idea, uh, also addressing a key challenge of any major city, access to fresh and healthy produce for everybody, and at the same time, you also utilize all the unused roof areas of public buildings. Really a great idea. And uh, you also plan to build a, or implement a pilot project and build an urban farm in, uh, on a rooftop in Zurich. I think it's cool, and we in the Rockwell Group also have a lot of no uh, knowledge about uh, urban farming and urban gardening, and we would like to uh, offer uh, to organize a workshop and share our knowledge with you uh, when you kick off this project. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you, Connie, and congrats, Edible Roofs. So we have, those were the three prizes that the jury hands out. We have two jurors who we haven't heard from yet, but we will hear from both of you later in handing out the, the public award and announcing a special partnership. So thank you for the jury for making this possible because we heard three people speak, but it was all of your work. So thank you and applause to all of you and you can take your seat here. Thanks. You can. So we're changing gears now. I would like to ask Tom to join me on stage. We're going from the Citizens Project to the Cities Project. And we are super grateful at Climate Kick to have worked for this project together with the Crowder Lab at the ETH Zurich. Um, so a big thanks to the entire team, Tara, Diana, Tom and Tom. It's been a big pleasure working with you. And we're very curious ourselves to hear what's coming up. Tom, the floor is yours on Wise Cities. Great. Thanks. That's fantastic. So exciting to be here and feel this energy. It's amazing. Yeah, last year was the year of climate activism. I think we can all agree that. But if, if all of that energy and enthusiasm is going to turn into anything, this year has to be the year of climate action. Our lab last year showed that there's room for about a trillion trees on our planet that could capture a huge amount of carbon if restored naturally and in the right areas. And this can really contribute in our fight against climate change. And on the back of that, two weeks ago, we launched the Trillion Tree Campaign in Davos. And that was really exciting. But in this context, the tree is just a symbol, a symbol for sustainable living. So as we continue to decarbonize our economies and cut emissions, these trees can play a really important role to draw down some of that excess carbon from the atmosphere. And the simplicity of that message meant that it's almost engaged people from the furthest extremes of the political spectrum so far extreme that we would never have targeted them in the first place. People like Trump and Al Gore lending their support for this kind of movement. And when we can have that kind of bipartisan support, we can really start to see visions towards that sustainable future. And when, when we launched it, I was sitting next to Jane Goodall, and she actually said, you know, this is great, we want to see these ecosystems restored, but what about cities? Shouldn't we be restoring trees in cities? 
And this was fantastic because it gave me the opportunity to really talk about how we enact that change. Because cities are the seeds of this global movement. Cities are where most of us live. And by 2050, that ex the, the proportion of us is likely to be around 70% of us living in cities. That's an incredible population. And that means it's the engagement. It's the place where, we, where humans interact with the climate. It's not just the places of innovation for the global solutions, but it's the places of, lo pla the, the places of local adaptation to address and, ad and adapt to changing environmental conditions. So these cities are so important. And last year we showed that about 80% of the world's cities are likely to experience striking changes in their environmental conditions by 2050. Paris, where we're sitting right now, is likely to resemble the climate of Istanbul by 2050. And 22% of the world's cities are likely to experience climate conditions that don't exist on the planet today. Particularly in the tropics, we're going to see vast, huge changes in precipitation reg regimes and drought that are going to lead to huge consequences for human health and infrastructure. And all of this means that cities aren't just the places of the global innovation, the innovation that allows us to cut emissions and have that global impact, but they're the places for the local innovation, the local innovation that allows us all to adapt and take a part as individuals. So of course innovation is going to be the center of this, cutting emissions and finding those solutions. And we also hope that nature can play a, uh, can play a role, both facilitating those, those, um, those solutions and also having that global scale impact on the carbon cycle and the local scale impact on, warm, uh, on cooling, the, cooling the local environment and managing the water cycle. But the best solutions will be the systemic ones that bring together all of those strategies in order to have, to, to, to have the biggest impacts on society, but also to engage all of us as citizens. And that is why we're so excited to be here for the Cities Award, because this award is supposed to enable those solutions to become a reality. We've had 33 incredible proposals from cities all over the world in five different continents, and it's been so exciting to see them engaging. And the, the, the leading cities, the cities that reached the final, have been absolutely inspirational. I said that this is the year of climate action. These are the people that are b building those solutions to enable that action. And this Cities Award, we were so excited to partner with EIC Climate Kick to make those awards, to make those solutions become a reality. So we're hoping that from these awards, they will gain some of the funding but also some of the expertise and the advocacy that can enable them to make those solutions become a reality. So that just leaves me to thank everybody. Thank you so much to EIC Climate Kick for bringing scientists to the people who are going to enact those solutions. Thank you also to the experts and my fellow jurors who are going to be, who've been providing their expertise, their enthusiasm to support all of these movements. But most importantly and undoubtedly, thank you so much to the cities who are the people that are going to make this change happen. I said it's the year of climate action and cities and their citizens are where that begins. So that just leaves me to invite my fellow jurors up and we're going to hear from all of the cities about those fantastic solutions right now. Thanks very much. <laughs> So you were so enthusiastic that you missed the slides. Um, can I ask all the city's jurors to please come on stage and take your seat over here? Um, out of the seven jurors, um, we have Ben Smith, Celia Blauel, John Vidal, Julio Lombreras, Kirsten Dunlop, Nancy Seich, and Tom Crowder. And I believe Nancy is sick. Is that, am I correct? No. You're here? Sorry. Celia, sorry. Okay, there was a last-minute cancellation of what Celia is not there. Please take a seat over here. Um, Tom, you can come over here. I think that works best. So let me explain how we're going to do the presentations for the city, because it's slightly different. We have five projects, so each of them has actually three minutes' time to present themselves uh, in front of your audience. And um, I think it's important that, to remember that these projects have not been incubated usually at the Climathon, so they usually did not have pitching training there. This is the first time they're kept to three minutes for such a presentation. So I admire the cities very much for coming along on that experience um, with us. After we've heard the presentations, we will hear from the jury members a statement on what they like about the project, feedback that they may have. And again, whilst we hear the feedback from the jury members, there's an opportunity for you guys to vote via Slido using the code Climathon. But I'll repeat that when that happens. 
And only then, in the end, Tom will come back on stage to hand out the awards. So the first city that I would like to ask on stage, and I hope you guys are uh, ready, is actually Salvador. We're traveling to Brazil here. Daniela, you are the first one to kick it off today. So an applause for Daniela to come on stage. So, the microphone, and that's the clicker. Green means next slide. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello, jury members. So, Salvador is a city of almost 3 million people, where one-fourth of the population lives below the poverty line. And to make Salvador Brazilian, we need to overcome social inequality, which will be aggravated by climate change. And as more extreme weather events occurs, there will be an increase in the flooding slides and, and in the flooding and landslides affecting the poorest communities the most. The impact aggra is aggravated by the poor disposal of waste, as you can see in the pictures. So how can we mitigate, mitigate emissions to avoid extreme weather events and how to raise awareness and educate citizens? We had successful results and positive impacts with our school garden programs that created social cohesion and well-being and improved heating habits as the vegetables grown were used in the school meals and as the kids also start eating more vegetables in their homes. So based on that, we want to increase the project impact by promoting a sustainable floods food system and in reducing emissions and waste from the implementation of a composting system and reuse of rainwater in the schools. We plan on doing that by working in partnerships with startups, the private sector, school staff, and the whole community, and in where the kids will be the multiplier of the knowledge to their families and their communities, increasing the project impact. So it benefits citizens as it increases green spaces and has a positive impact on health and well-being Besides, it makes future generations the enablers of change. So, if so far, the composting system implemented in schools, in one school for a pilot project, in one year was able to compost a thousand kilograms of organic waste and avoid the emission of 309 A.6 greenhouse gases and it impacted 150 kids. Those kids already involved their families and community as they start separating waste in the home to bring the organic waste to be composted in schools. And as we are part of C40 and 100RC, we can share our learning and best practices with other cities. And as this is a cheap and very simple project to implement, we believe it can be replicated by other cities and easily scaled up to other schools. Our goal is to scale it up to 10 schools, one in each district of the city in order to make more citizens aware, conscience, have less waste, incorrectly disposed, and fight climate change. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks so much, Daniela. Well done. Uh, don't worry, you did a great job. Um, you were actually, you had five seconds left. So you could have told even more. Um, you still have the clicker, right? Then I take this one. Okay, so now we would love to hear from, um, from a jury member, actually. So Nancy, you are going to tell us more about Salvador. So thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here from the European Investment Bank, and I enjoyed looking at all of the submissions of the cities. But I want to comment about out yours, because um, composting is, is not new. Composting is not new. What I find new about this is just how many win, 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 win <laughs> boxes this project is ticking. And, and um, um, I think as a, as a climate change expert, I can focus on the greenhouse gas and I can focus on the reduction of the emissions. And um, as a mum who's been involved in school projects in Luxembourg where we said, let's have school gardens, uh, I think the most fantastic thing about this is joining basically a school project, which is fantastic education uh, and, and really empowering the next generation with a massive environmental and climate problem and just joining these dots up. And um, 
not only are you empowering the next generation, um, but you're actually using their power to share amongst other kids. And what I really liked in the project was the fact that it would be the kids that would be going, you know, school to school sharing and sharing the knowledge. What I also liked was uh, just referring to one of the earlier cases where they talked about the transportation costs. Uh, I love the fact that by getting the kids to bring the waste from the homes, you kind of solve the transport costs because they're <laughs> going to school anyway, and, and now they're bringing their composting material with them, which I, I mean, apart from presumably not muddling it up with their homework is, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is very good. The, the other thing I thought, apart from having all this amazing links between waste, water collection, greenhouse gas reductions, environmental improvements, avoiding, you know, reducing impacts of extreme weather, health and nutrition and education, what I thought was amazing was your ambition. I mean, unless I misread the numbers, your one-year target was a 30 times increase, which I just think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. That in itself is, you know, take the pilot and let's just go. And I just thought that was, was really admirable. And, uh, and I think that with these kids behind you, as well as young people in the city, uh, I think you can do it. And I have done a lot of talks to schools, and I always try and think of things that you can say to the kids what they can do, because they are really worried about this. And we want to give them things they can do. And this is giving them something they can do, which not only makes their lives better, but actually helps globally. And I think that that is absolutely brilliant, and I really like it. And I would like to say that um, EIB is a global multilateral development bank, and we do fund projects in Brazil. It's lending, it's not grants, but we do like to work with cities and my urban colleagues would be very interested to understand if there is some way where the bank could possibly also support this. So just to open the conversation. Thank you so much, Nancy and Daniela. So much. Thank you. I forgot to mention the voting is open. So Piotr, maybe we can leave the question a little bit open again, rating all of the city's projects as well on the same scale that you have seen before. Now, this is truly an international show you will see. We're moving actually now to the United States, to Miami. And David and Walter, you're both presenting together because then we need two microphones, and which I think we have here. All right, so please come on stage. An applause for Miami, please. And here's your clicker, you need to clicker. All right, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so we have the great opportunity today to present the One Earth Living Street design. Um, and what is this? Uh, this is an opportunity to rethink our roadways for green infrastructure and how they can be better uh, uh, designed to, um, uh, to be better worked with our natural systems. So the image on the left, is our existing street. Very harsh condition, designed specifically for vehicles, no landscaping, and very uh, hard pavement and terrible drainage system. The image on the right, 200 years ago, that would have been this street, an integral part of the Everglade uh, system in, in Florida. Let's talk about the problems. So this neighborhood in Miami, with all this industrial uh, cement, is one of the hottest urban heat islands in the city, which is causing heat and humidity and created a new type of rain that required a new lexicon in city decision making. We call it a rain bomb in Miami. It comes from nowhere and it just started. Um, and we also have the, the heaviest rain in the country and the highest winds in the world because of hurricanes. So for us, the living street is to start with the geology, which is the most porous on the planet because of the old karst landscape, and inserting a living forest and contiguous roots that are interconnected and supercharging nature with structural soils and wetland soils that can uh, capture 40 times more carbon than a standard street tree soil. Keep in mind the way we're planting, planting trees in, the, in cities is all wrong. Uh, a year ago, this didn't exist. A trillion trees idea was starting to influence thought in cities as well as trillion solar panels. So what we look to do is copy nature. Nature lowers the groundwater every day the hotter it gets. 
because the roots are connected to the groundwater. We now want to interconnect our roots to Miami's groundwater, which is rising with sea level rise. And 100 gallons per day per tree will help cool that heat island effect. But we're also designing our roads wrong. On the left is the way our roads are designed today, all for the car in the United States, with three feet left for you to walk your dog after work. We're going to invert that, deprioritize the car, multi-mobile mobility, uh, human-powered mobility, and more space for landscape to, to be a, a tree utility. This is replicable across the city. We don't have to do the entire city, just about 10 to 20% little hot spots that we can address. The benefits are massive. Um, supercharged carbon sequestration, groundwater management and cooling the air, reducing stormwater infrastructure vulnerability by not depending on the pipes and the pumps, and most important, economic circularity, increased storefront foot traffic and reduced risk of costs. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys, for the presentation. Um, also for you, we have asked one of the jurors, Ben Smith, to give some feedback from your perspective. Good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations, David and Walter. Um, I thought this was a really fantastic uh, project. Um, it was fantastic to be able to read the application. It delivers, for me, it ticks so many boxes, delivers so many benefits, but, but not in a tokenistic way. I, I felt this project could actually have some real impact in terms of carbon reduction as well. So as you've heard already, it kind of responds to the drivers of climate change. It's looking at attenuation to offset um, increased flooding, um, cooling from the trees through evapotranspiration because of rising, uh, rising temperatures um, in the streets in Miami. Um, the design is really clever. It feels like this is a replicable solution that could be rolled out not only across Miami, but actually across many cities in the world. And I think Jane is right. I think cities do need generally more trees in them. Um, so... For me, that was really why you know, I, I felt that such a, it was such a strong uh, proposal. It was the design elements, but really the replicability of, the, of it and the scale that you could achieve. Um, and the fact that so many other cities, I think, could follow your lead um, in doing that. So congratulations, both of you. Thank you so much, Ben, for your help. Congrats to you guys as well. All right, I forgot to mention again the voting. Sorry about that. So again, slido.com, Climathon rate, also Miami on the scale one to five. And Piotr, we can keep the question open. Slightly longer. We're going to the other side of the world without causing CO2 this time. We're going to Sudan, and we're gonna actually going to hear from Razan for the next presentation. We're going to do it together. Ah. Okay. I think the order was different, but we worked it out. All right. So this is your microphone, and this is the clicker. And whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Hi everyone. So our project is sorry, documentation and sharing of local climate knowledge in Khartoumi city, which is the most populated city of S in Sudan. It's a kind of place where you can find all the different culture and ethnicities in one place. It represents a mixture between urban and rural culture. Very recently, Sudan went through a massive grassroots revolution. This revolution, we lost on it hundreds of young lives to put an end to a 30-year dictatorship regime. Sudan's revolution gave us a hope for freedom, peace, and justice, but it also showed us a great lesson on the valuable role of empowering people to collaborate and share. Khartoum city is one of the most vulnerable cities to climate change. In 2013 and 2019, uh, we lost hundreds of um, uh, sorry, 100 people due to the flood. The solution we are offering is to document and harvest local climate knowledge, a body, a body of knowledge that is built up through community um, due, uh, sorry, uh, during different generations and over years. We will be using innovative means of documentation, such as social media, um, uh, online database, uh, uh, documentary films, and live events. We believe this project will develop a better understanding of the climate change history. Through this project, we can also feed into air existing early warning systems to better respond to climate change disasters. We will also be able to formulate research questions and hypotheses, as well as support governments and donor agencies to frame robust, 
projects that are actually based on local insights. We will scale up best practices and, ad and adaptation, not only at the local level and national level, but also at the regional and international levels. We are already supported by Khartoum High Council for Environment and Natural Resources, so we will be able to scale up. Through this project, we will be able to develop a better understanding of the interdependent relationship between people, nature, and culture. We don't want all, all, uh, only our value, local knowledge to be valued in our society, but also in the decision-making process and scientific research. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, also for you, we're going to hear from uh, John Vidal for some feedback. And again, a reminder for you guys to rate the project now on Slido. Uh, I don't know if you've been to Khartoum. Khartoum is one of the most amazing cities in the world. It's a great African city. It's a great Arab city. And like everything in Africa, it's coming up with its own solutions. And for the first time ever, instead of a city saying, no, we're going down the technological route, we're going down the financial route, it's going down the cultural route. It's saying to its citizens, yes, you've got the stories, you've got the knowledge, you've got the wherewithal, the understanding, and the potential to tell us the authorities, how we should change. People know what has, they've, throughout history, their culture has told them how to adapt to huge changes. Khartoum will see these changes, and Khartoum's people, by going back and asking them, will find those uh, answers for themselves. It's a fantastic idea. I heartily recommend every city in the world goes back, talks to its people. How do you think we should change? What should we do? Don't let just the bureaucrats and the elites take you. Let's go to the people. Let's understand what their point of view is. I totally agree. I shall come to Khartoum. I shall write about it. I think, I think it's a superb idea. Well done. Thank you so much, John, and congrats to Khartoum as well. Thank you. All right, for the fourth city, we're going to Malaysia. Penang, please come and join us on stage. I see you need two microphones. Uh, applause for Penang. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hello everyone. Let me introduce you briefly. Penang has an incredible climate and a very multicultural community that has a strong connection to nature. We are also proud of our UNESCO World Heritage Site and for being a street food paradise. Climate change is an urgent problem in Penang with the four main areas of impact. Heat stress, flooding, vulnerable communities, and uh, gaps in institutional capacity. The population is already feeling the, the impacts of climate change, as we have um, confirmed in community engagements. Yep, we have um, done several workshops with the technical experts and local leaders, as well as on-site engagement with the vulnerable communities. And we found out that the experts are focusing on flood impacts, whereas the community are prioritizing on heat stress. So uh, the temperature has risen significantly in Penang, as you can see in this map. However, the hospital in Malaysia do not recognize heat stress and heat stroke. So how can Penang address all of these four challenges? We have to go by social innovation, nature-based solution, and institutional change. By adopting a holistic approach, we are able to address the social and the environmental dimension because these are two are deeply interrelated. We also need to include all sectors of society. This is actually the first time in Malaysia that all level of uh, governance, together with the scientific institution, international and local, come together to address climate adaptation. We are bringing nature back into the city in order to reduce temperatures and heat stress by strategically planting trees and uh, naturalizing waterways, and also to reduce flooding by introducing upstream retention and uh, uh, blue corridors. In terms of social vulnerability, we will empower uh, exposed communities and women and girls by including them in climate-related decision-making processes. In terms of institutional capacity, we will develop a pilot project for detection of heat stress and heat stroke in public hospitals in Penang. Most importantly, 
we will uh, create a knowledge management platform to mainstream a framework for municipal climate adaptation for all cities in Malaysia. Beyond these climate impacts, this program is all about protecting the essence of Penang, its people and the unique character of Penang. We hope that we can be the pioneer and inspire another cities in Malaysia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well Thank you. You guys can stay on stage. Thanks so much. So to give feedback to Penan, we're very happy to have Julio Nombias with us. Maybe hand one mic, Julio. Thank you. Well, I've never been to Penang, and I wish I, I was there before. But I can imagine this island in Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, in a developing country, where they are really suffering this climate problem. So they are suffering heat waves, flooding, and what I like from this project is that they, instead of uh, thinking and, I mean, convening people and thinking in a technological solution, I'm an engineer and that's the typical approach we do and we think about potential solutions. They put people at the front and especially vulnerable people, vulnerable communities, and they put them to think about solutions. And they, come up, they came up with a solution to bring back nature to the city. And this has so many benefits, not only the climate benefits in terms of resilience, but also health benefits, well-being benefits, air quality benefits, job creation, other benefits. And I also like very much the creation of capacities to maintain this project and to, to uh, scale up and to provoke really systemic change in the city. And as they've said at the, at the end, to create this knowledge base to explore the idea and to work with other areas in Malaysia and worldwide to, to expand and to provoke change. Thank you. Thank you so much for the feedback and for your welcome. All right, so Nancy, I know you need to leave right at one. Or are you okay? It's okay. Okay, great, perfect. We're moving for the fifth presentation to Dublin, to Ireland. Um, Simon, if I can ask you to come to the stage for the fifth presentation. The microphone, the clicker, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Niels, and thank you, everybody, for the opportunity. We are Dublin City Council, and our mission is to transform how we approach climate change in the city. Dublin is our home, and we want to protect our environment and the quality of life for future generations in the city. The problem that we are trying to face down is simple. It is our rain, and it has changed dramatically. We are experiencing more frequent and more intense bursts of rain than we ever have before, and our drainage system cannot handle this rain. It is operating at and beyond capacity. This is leading to dramatic flooding. Rapid urbanization and hard surfaces mean the water has nowhere to go. It has no natural home. And these floods are having devastating impacts on our citizens. And they are creating environmental pollution. This is threatening the livelihood and the well-being of our citizens. We must adapt, and we must adapt now. Our solution is to take our recently adopted climate change action plan and use it as a vehicle for change, to introduce natural water retention measures throughout our city, wherever possible, as widely as possible. And in order to do this, we need systems change. We need to think differently. We need to engage our colleagues in a new way of thinking, putting these measures front and center of urban and city planning in everything that we do. We need to engage our communities and work hand in hand with them, ask for their support and demonstrate the benefits of these measures and how they can be replicated locally, regionally, nationally and internationally and within homes, businesses and communal spaces. And we want to do this in a scientific way. We want to use our expertise in our Smart Dublin program to introduce technologies to measure the benefits, to assess how effective our interventions have been. We have a partnership with Trinity College that will study on an academic basis the effectiveness and we will measure the human behaviour changes. These interventions should improve people's quality of lives. The benefits are manifold, from reducing the heat island effect to increased rainwater demand to better community engagement, amenity and at the knock-on economic benefits of that. And these measures align with the sustainable development goals. As I said already, they are replicable, they are scalable, they are doable. And the impact, well the impact is clear. Have a look at these photos of how our city could look. Have a look at these project designs. 
and the changes that you can see in the cities. Imagine a city that is greener, that is softer, that has more planting, that has more biodiversity. Imagine a city that is strengthened and climate resilient and future-proofed for challenges that we will face on an ongoing basis. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Simon. All right. So, fifth feedback, and don't remember forget to vote uh, for the project. Kirsten, thank you so much for stepping in for Celia to give feedback on Dublin so spontaneously. You have your mic. I hope so. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I am representing Celia, <laughs> change of hat and skin. Um, and she has written a response which I wanted to convey to you. So uh, she's speaking also from a sense of fellow feeling in Paris. And her response was particularly around a recognition of the complexity of the water system around Dublin and within Dublin, which means that this is, a not a, this is an extremely <laughs> difficult and complex problem. Um, and the fact that the water retention measures and our community-based actions are a perfect example of an ins inclusive environmental policy. Uh, this initiative aiming to reduce the impacts of flooding through vegetal and incremental measures includes citizens to the very first step of climate change uh, in a form of adaptive urban planning. Um, by storing carbon, decreasing air pollutants through the greening of the urban area, but also by adapting, adapting drainage. Uh, she, you, she sees in Dublin's project here an illustration of public anticipation to ongoing climate challenges. So she really wanted to call out a sense of recognition from Paris that similar things are being tried. Um, the value of the urban heat island is something she's particularly aware of, that this is something that in Paris is of um, a major focus and concern. She said in similar issues, the Paris City Council voted in March 2018 a plan of rainwater retention and rain gardens that is very close to Dublin's. But the analysis that she's made of Dublin's measures showed us how important it is to include citizens and that people are the best possible help to administration and politics to operate the transformations they asked for. So she particularly wanted to compliment you on the thoughtfulness, the care, and the strategic nature of those decision-making and the way you've designed it. Compliments. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kirsten, for stepping up. So now the moment comes to award who wins the city. And um, I would like to ask all city representatives if you could all wait over here so that we have a smooth transition, because Tom has a small surprise for us, I believe. Uh, no, you don't need to click, I think. Don't need that. So if everybody who's part of the city who was on stage before could come over here to be Arcus, just so make sure that everything moves smoothly. So I think as everybody has just seen, deciding amongst these solutions was incredibly difficult. Not only were they exceptional, but they were so diverse and varied that we felt like it was wrong to give a winner and then losers because everyone here was a loser. A, a winner. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even intentional. <laughs> Everyone's a loser. This is Brexit day, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I don't know exactly. if that has yeah. to do with a slip of tongue. <laughs> so what we decided is instead of giving one winner and all the losers, that every single city would, would be awarded a name, a name that represents their innovation, the innovat innovative solutions that they are championing. So the four runners up, I will, I'll introduce first. And each one of them will get this, this title. And the first of those runners up is Khartoum, who will be now, from now on, known as the city of cultural innovation. Come to the stage. So please come up. Here, you hand it over. So thanks. <laughs> All right. If you can wait in the back, please, next to the door is So the next of the fantastic runners-up is Dublin, who are the city of resilient design. Dublin. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, you're going to come too. Sorry, you're too. Oh. You guys can also wait over there, please, on stage. Thanks. And the third is Miami, who are getting the Global Award for Infrastructure. The fourth. The fourth and final of our runners-up is Salvador, 
the city of sustainable communities. And that means that our global overall climate climathon winner is Penang. Congratulations. Please come up and accept your award. So I think, are we now doing a photo? Um, let's do plan? that. Yeah, let's, let's just do, do a photo. photo. It's happening. If we're everybody <laughs> here. I'll go at the end. Okay. So with that, I would like to say a big thank you to our jurors and all the cities for the fantastic work and the crowd lab for your partnership. Thank you so much, guys. And Thanks so much. All right. So you guys, it's also... All right, so if you're doing timekeeping, uh, we have about 10 more minutes, and we have still two awards to give, the ones that you, together with everybody around the globe, help to give, the public awards. But before we do that, I would really take a moment to actually celebrate heroes that often go forgotten. Because you've heard from citizens taking actions. You've heard from city governments. You've heard from us at EIT Climate Kick what we are actually doing. But none of us, None of us are the people who actually on the ground in the cities make sure that climathons happen. They are actually our community of local organizers who care about their city, who want to make it greener and cleaner, and who take the initiative to actually start working on bringing climathon to their city, often without any sense of resources being there. And I think it is really important to honor their work. A lot of them will watch the live recording of this show, so I think I would like to have a big hand of applause for the unsung heroes of Climathon, our local organizers. <laughs> okay, so for those of you um, with a good eye for detail, you saw a lot of the similar logos over there. This uh, Bordeaux Red Square with Impact Hub in there. And that is because in 2019, we have actually piloted a scaling partnership, and Gabriela Gandel, who was part of the Citizens' Jury and is director of the Impact Hub Network, is with us today. Um, so maybe, Gabriela, for those of you who do not know, yes, please, um, say something. What is Impact Hub actually, and why did you decide to partner with Climathon? Just speak, it works. Yeah, perfect. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to have organized 14 cities Climathons. Uh, we are the largest global network of social entrepreneurs and innovators in the world. We're in 62 countries and 102 cities. So uh, the matching with Climathon is perfect because uh, we believe in entrepreneurial action, innovation, particularly connected innovation, climate action, and citizen engagement. So it's a pleasure to connect, and that's why we connect, because we're a great multiplication platform for these formats. Great. And so a second question maybe for you is then, what is the outlook for 2020? What are we moving towards with the partnership? Well, uh, what was the goal? 2,000 cities? <laughs> 1,000 yeah. first and then 2,000, <laughs> yes. Exactly. I'm going for that goal. Uh, well, for the next year, we really definitely want to at least double, if not triple, the expansion of Impact Hubs organizing this on the ground so we can contribute well to that target, uh, but also increase the number of partnerships we bring, bring together for the long-term sustainability of these solutions and for the transfer of learning from these innovations into other systems. So, yeah, let's focus on that together, and I'm confident we can make it happen. <laughs> thanks so much, Gabriela, and thanks for the partnership. Thank you. All right. Um, Impact Hub was our scaling partner, but we've worked together with a lot of different partners throughout this year to actually make Climathon possible. Um, and a big thanks goes to all of them. You see their logos in the back of us. They've been on the journey with us this year, and they're going... Most of them, or not near all of them, are going with us on the journey in the future as well. So a big applause also for our partners. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Public awards. The final two awards that we will hand out. Um, and the way this is going to work, we're first going to hand out the citizens' winner, um, and then we're going to do the city's winner. 
um, for now. And I would like to ask, in order to hand out the Citizens Award, Afros Shah on stage, so please join me here. And I believe, Afros, you are at the moment still the only person who knows uh, who won this award together with one member of our team, so I'm as excited as you are. Can I have the praise? So, I would say, let's, here's your microphone, Afros. <laughs> You are also going to announce the winner of the audience vote and then say a few words about the project. So the winner is... Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Should I do a Tom on you? <laughs> the loser is... <laughs> no, I think I'll see, stick to straight. Uh, the winner is What Packaging. What Package. What Package. Please come to the stage. So again, this was put together out of your votes and all of the votes that you guys um, selected already online before the event. I give it to you and then you can hand it to Lisa. <laughs> so from your perspective, a few words about the project, Afos. First of all, I must uh, tell Lisa she will give my weekends back. A lot of volunteers work cleaning the beaches and mangroves. <laughs> so your app is going to do precisely that. And good Lord will have a s Sunday off. But having said that, plastic is a huge problem. And what you have come up with is, which is very innovative. And this is required not only all over the world, but every city must link up to it. I like that you want to take the packaging back and take it in a sustainable way, reuse it. I think it's very, very innovative. In Mumbai, I must share my experience. All restaurants dole out on Swiggy and name the apps, packaging after packaging. You know, at my home, I order food and uh, utensils. I carry my packaging bag. So if you come to Mumbai, probably I'll have a, I can order on the phone. So that's a good <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's a wonderful thing to see youngsters, you know, coming up with these ideas. I wish in Mumbai we are, in India we are 1.5 billion. I hope some of, all, some of these youngsters will rise from there. Congratulations once again, and I hope uh, this works in Estonia, this works in the world, and this works in India as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, so one moment of suspense, and Kirsten, I'm gonna ask you to come on stage uh, a final time to hand out the public award for the city's track, and again, I think it's only you um, and our team member knowing who won the vote finally. So, oh, you still have the headset? Did it work before? Let's see, does this work? Yes, yes it's works. working. All right. So again, Kirsten, the winner of the public voting is? Okay, with great pleasure. The winner of the public votes is Dublin. Woohoo! Yeah. So please, Simon, come to the stage. The second team member is right in the middle of the room, which gives a beautiful view. Two more. Congratulations. Great. Congratulations. Again. Congratulations. 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 So I think a reflection that I would like to make on, on your presentation, on what we heard from cities generally and on the citizens. You know, you heard me this morning, or this, yes, this morning, it's still the morning. Um, talk about the importance of transformative change, systems thinking, structures, how do we get everything into play? And then you hear a series of presentations, and I think it's important for us to call out for ourselves. And then what you hear is something that then sort of feels like it shrinks back down to things we know about, how to do roof gardens, and how to do rain gardens, and how to create pocket parks, and how to set up mechanisms that feel more incremental and familiar than they feel transformative. And I think this is one of the most important reflections for us to take, that what is at stake here is how do we do joined up thinking? How do we, on the one hand, do radical optimization of the things that we have, but that we are not actually combining at scale? How do we build on some of those to look beyond to the things we haven't even thought about, but it's very hard to look for things you haven't thought about if you don't have the basic conditions of human well-being and safety and security and emotional well-being to do that. And much of what we heard from the cities and the citizens is so much about that. And ultimately, that's what comes back to Dublin. In the end, people matter. This change is not about technology. It is about people. And people really 
have to internalize a sense of ownership, of creativity, of possibility, of generation, and that is very much around what is in here in Dublin. How would you, person by person, construct a different relationship with our future? And I think that is a common ground in all of what we've heard. It's the essence of what Climathon is about. And my congratulations to all of you and to Dublin for having enshrined that notion of we're going to do this one local council and street at a time. Thank you. Thank you, you well so done. Much. Thanks so much, guys. Right. So, if you've just looked at the time, you've seen that two hours are nearly past. And I would like to share some closing remarks with you all, but that doesn't feel right that it's just me uh, standing on stage. I'm actually going to do something. I'm going to ask everybody who contributed to a climate fund to come to the stage and move in as fast as you can. So please, everybody, cities, citizens, also people we haven't had on stage, please come on stage. Um, for the Climathon experience. And you're probably wondering, okay, 30, 40 people on this small stage, are we gonna make it work? Um, we're gonna try to use it. Please come on, guys. Tessa, bring them on, come. Keep moving fast, we have to do this fast. <laughs> Keep moving. Everybody. Everybody, please come on, take them, Björk. Okay. So, thank you. So the ones who are sporty can also try the little jump here, if you want to give it a go. So when I co-organized the Climathon in Zurich, uh, we also did this toward the end to actually get everybody on stage who contributed. And I think it is always quite a powerful testimony. So please keep on moving in. We have to fill the rows more. Keep on coming. Keep moving, keep moving. It's okay. Um, it's quite a powerful testimony if you actually see everybody that's contributed. And I think also to remember, this is just the people that we have here. We've been in 145 cities around the world where you've seen these kind of communities happening. So, what is the best place for me to be? Um, so I'm actually going down to stand here. So ladies and gentlemen, everybody, um, Climathon started in 2015 as a small idea with a few people who thought maybe we can work together with cities and organize hackathons. And just in the past five years, it has grown organically around the world. And I think the reason that it has grown organically is not because we received a lot of money or somebody said, this is what we have to do. It's because citizens around the world said, we care about our cities. We have to do something. And I think it's thanks to all the people you see here, all of the thousands around the world that are watching us right now, that are with us right now, that actually make sure that climathons can happen. And we're on a journey. We're just getting started to take this to a thousand cities. Dear everybody, Climathon really is the defining problem of our time. And only together can we really make a dent into the system because it is possible. Join us on Climathon's next one happening, 13 November 2020, as the program. A big thank you, and I think the final applause goes to everybody in the audience, particularly everybody here and everybody around the world. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks for coming. An applause for everybody. Yeah. Right. Yeah, try.